the arcade classics come home to NES. Uh, kind of. On episode 52 of NES Works. The fall of 1987 saw a massive explosion of new talent for the NES. It was the point at which the console reached critical mass. Up until this point, the NES and its handful of publishing partners could have ended up as a small blip in history, resulting in a few memorable releases that would go down in the collective memory of a handful of people who were there for it as a great but largely overlooked little moment in video game history. But at this point, the NES is clearly here for the long haul. Past few episodes have seen the arrival of Booterbund, Hudson, and IREM to the console. This episode, we have two games that bring a total of four new studios into the fold. Three of these four would go on to become vital contributors to the NES Pantheon. The other was Acclaim. Okay, that's not entirely fair to Acclaim. They did publish some good stuff through the years, including the brilliant Double Dragon 2. But their successes always seem to be one of those proverbial cases of a stopped clock being right twice a day. Acclaim didn't demonstrate a whole lot of discretion when it came to quality, but they sure could lock down a promising license. As a result, Acclaim would go on to be one of the most profitable companies of the Nintendo cartridge era, right up through the N64. Acclaim is also notable for being the first American company to have emerged specifically to take advantage of the NES market. Bruderbund was the first US company to join the Nintendo family, but they'd been around since the early 80s. Acclaim got its start here in 1987, and 3D World Runner kicked things off. To be fair, Acclaim was no fly-by-night newcomer. The company's prehistory, I think, actually says a lot about the buzz that Nintendo's console began to generate in the US around this time, and what the system represented for an industry that had nearly petered out. The men who founded Acclaim, Greg Fishbach, Jim Skoroposky, and Robert Holmes, had been Activision employees during the Atari 2600 days. When the US console market collapsed, they left the games industry for a while. The rise of the NES, however, inspired them to join back together and launch a new company, which initially existed simply as a publisher. Acclaim, a name chosen because it came before Activision and business listings, spent its first decade or so of existence licensing games from Japan and hiring external Western studios to bang out digital renditions of the various multimedia licenses it managed to lock down. The movie and TV licenses would come later, though. With one notable exception, Acclaim's 1987 lineup consists almost entirely of games that they harvested from the Famicom library, such as this very first title. 3D World Runner, or more formally, the 3D Battles of World Runner, represents the NES debut of another major player to be, Squaresoft. Best known as the zippers and anime hair half of RPG giant Square Enix these days, Squaresoft was just on the cusp of unlocking its destined future right here at the fall of 1987. Their breakout hit Final Fantasy would ship in Japan in December. At this point though, the company was struggling to make its voice heard in the games industry or more to the point, struggling to figure out what that voice even was. Squaresoft was one of the many video game ventures to have been initiated during the Famicom boom of the mid-80s. It was spun out of a utilities company that eventually faded away as its offshoot rose to acclaim, as it were. Square spent the first few years of its existence trying its hand at a whole lot of dead ends. It licensed properties like Aliens to middling effect. It opened its own Famicom Disk System publishing branch, and with games like 3D World Runner, it attempted to use dazzling tech tricks to wow the masses. 3D World Runner could be seen by and large as an attempt to capture the magic of Sega's Space Harrier on NES. Since Sega wasn't publishing on NES, that left the door wide open for someone else to step in and fill that Harrier-shaped hole in the platform's heart. In fact, Square wasn't alone. A few months after 3D World Runner debuted, Pony Canyon published a more blatant Harrier clone called Attack Animal Gakuin. And a few years later, Takara brought over the actual Space Harrier thing to profoundly disappointing effect. 3D World Runner is honestly the best of these efforts, despite only really playing like Space Harrier during its infrequent boss encounters. Its quality can probably be attributed to the involvement of one Nasir Gabelli, an Iranian-American programmer known for his virtuosic work on Apple II. And you know what console ran on the same 6502 processor that powered the Apple II? That's right, the NES. Squaresoft recruited Gabelli as, in effect, their answer to Satoru Iwata. Just as Iwata had boosted the quality of early Famicom releases like Balloon Fight and F1 Race thanks to his talents for coaxing performance out of the 6502, Gabelli did likewise for Squaresoft. 
In this case, Gabelli implemented two impressive technical tricks to make 3D World Runner stand out. First, there was a forward scrolling routine that did a pretty good job of bringing the fast-paced, behind-the-shoulder action of Space Harrier to NES. While the four-year-old console's visuals couldn't begin to compare to Sega's top-of-the-line arcade hardware, 3D World Runner does a pretty decent job of rendering a forward scrolling landscape at variable speeds. Some thoroughly acceptable sprite work captures the essence of superscalar tech, albeit without actually living up to Sega's coin-op standard. It was Gabelli's second trick here that really put the 3D into 3D World Runner, though. With a press of a button, 3D World Runner becomes an actual 3D game. The select button activates an anaglyphic visual mode that works with the packed-in 3D glasses to create an even more immersive sense of depth. This is old-school 3D, the stuff of Saturday cinemas and cheesy monster movies. 3D World Runner uses blue and red lens glasses to create its 3D effect. On alternating frames, the game shifts the on-screen location of objects to create a simulation of relative distances, while also cycling the color palette between red and blue shifted hues as appropriate. It's not an earth-shattering effect, but it's neat, not to mention forward thinking. Nintendo would launch a shutter-based 3D system in Japan about half a year after this game's debut in that market. And that would actually be used for 3D World Runner's Japan-only sequel, JJ Part 2. So Squaresoft was a little bit ahead of the curve here. The novelty does a bit to help lift the fact that 3D World Runner is nowhere near as intense or exciting a game as Space Harrier. Despite the visual similarities, this is less of a shoot 'em up and more of a platformer. Your protagonist, who is unnamed in the US version but called JJ, or Jump and Jack, in Japan only occasionally shoots at stuff. Mostly, JJ runs. Hence the game's title. Your goal is to run to the end of eight worlds, each broken into four segments. Yeah, just like Super Mario Brothers. You can adjust your speed, the height and distance of your leaps, and the angle at which you move into the screen. But that's pretty much it. It's basically a big obstacle course. And in a lot of ways, this plays more like a 3D version of Namco's Metro Cross than it does a home version of Space Harrier. Certain objects will drop power up or power down icons when you make contact with them, while other objects will kill JJ on contact. There are also a number of objects in the world that aren't technically fatal, but exist to obstruct your forward movement and knock you into a pit, which is fatal. It's a pretty aggressively difficult game. You really need to memorize the location and width of pits, while also learning the placement of enemies and the various tricks you need to avoid them. The game really goes for broke beginning in World 4, where you need to follow a very specific route in order to avoid being smacked down into holes by hovering robot hands. It's a highly challenging game, and it's difficult to imagine anyone being engrossed enough to actually master all eight worlds and the increasingly unfair gimmicks that pop up the further you advance into the adventure. There are a few elements scattered throughout the game to break up the monotony of running, such as hidden bonus zones where you can collect score-boosting star icons, but for the most part you're pretty much just running and jumping and trying to avoid enemies and pits. The only time 3D World Runner begins to really resemble Space Harrier is at the end of each world where you have to fight a boss. The action here becomes a matter of dodging a monster that moves into and out of the screen as you pump it full of bullets. It's pretty simple, at least in the first worlds, so maybe it's for the best that the creators went with a platformer style instead of a shooter if this is the best shooting they could come up with. Anyway, this is not an amazing start for Squaresoft or a claim, but it does at least hint at the drive for technical and visual excellence that would come to define Square's work. As for what it says about a claim, well, basically nothing. But they're both here, and they're both here to stay. Our second game this episode sees the arrival of both an old-timer and a newcomer all at once. Sky Kid comes to NES from the arcades, where it was one of coin-op giant Namco's lower-key second-tier works. A decent game, but not enough of a hit to see a sequel. It comes to NES courtesy of Sunsoft, a fresh upstart publisher that was just beginning to make a mark in Japan with ambitious, if messy, games like Madola no Tsubasa, an early action RPG with a heroine in the Athena vein, and the infamous Atlantis no Nazo. Sunsoft would become an NES giant in the US beginning in 1988 with Blaster Master, but here they were just some random publisher spitting out an old arcade game. Sky Kid is a decent enough concept, and this is a decent enough port. Its visuals are a little less detailed than the arcade cab, with smaller sprites and less texturing in some of the background elements, but there's no mistaking what this is meant to be. More importantly, it plays the way it should, with simple two-button aerial combat mechanics and support for simultaneous two-player action. There's not really a lot to Sky Kid, though. You control a tiny pilot, who may or may not be a bird, and commands a tiny biplane through a succession of missions. Each mission has the same structure. Take off, 
dogfight, collect a missile, drop the missile on an enemy base or two, then land. You actually don't even have to do the missile thing. The important thing is to land safely at the end. But you'll never reach the top of the scoreboard if you don't blast the living bejesus out of enemy bases, so swooping down to snatch that comically huge bomb is important. Sky Kid's plane comes with two features beyond defying the laws of gravity. You can fire straight ahead, and you can perform a quick evasive loop. When I say fire straight ahead, I don't mean straight ahead across the screen. I mean straight ahead based on Sky Kid's current orientation. Unlike in Gradius or Schoon, you bank when you change altitude, and your forward cannon fires at 45 degree angles as you're banking. This forces you to approach combat a little more strategically than in standard shooters, since your angle of fire is constantly shifting and you can't just veer up and down to clear out waves of foes. The loop feature also requires a bit of strategy to pull off correctly. Tapping the loop button causes you to dart backward in the large, rising arc, settling on screen higher and further back than you started. A loop can put you clear of danger in a thick field of fire, but it also runs the risk of causing you to zip backward right into an enemy. You're invincible while performing a loop, but if you happen to come to a rest in the same space a bad guy occupies once you come out of the loop, well that's tough luck for you. Loops also come with a secondary limitation, in that you can't execute them while toting a bomb. Once you snag the bomb, your journey to the end of the stage becomes a bit more challenging because tapping the loop button will instead cause you to release the bomb which you obviously don't want to do until you've reached the enemy base or carrier toward the end of the stage. Sky Kid is yet another difficult game here on NES. The first stage is pretty easy once you get the hang of the mechanics, but once you launch that second time, the gloves come off and Sky Kid offers no mercy. At times, the challenge feels stacked against the player, especially once the game introduces kamikaze pilots who make a beeline for your plane. They fly faster than your plane, and they can do spinning loops into your plane. But, you know, it is an arcade game, and that's how they rolled back then. This is an okay start for Sunsoft, but it does at least show off a bit of clout in bringing a recognizable arcade property to NES. It's not really indicative of the company's future output though. That would soon establish Sunsoft as one of the console's top original developers and publishers. As for Namco, well, they wouldn't publish an NES game in the US until 1993, in the waning days of the console. We'll actually see quite a few Namco creations on NES before 1993, but it's always going to be under the auspices of a different publisher. However, that is a tale for another time, specifically the next episode of NES Works. Mm -hmm.